hi, and welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm the host, Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And today, my guest is my friend Lee Cordner, who is a longtime energy consultant in California, former PG&E employee, who's now in Oregon. Lee, hi. Hi, Robert. How are you? I'm uh, well. I'm, I'm, I'm well, thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about the California blackouts today because this is very much in the news, and Lee has uh, one of the most, some of the most informed opinions on and views on the blackouts in California of anyone that I know of. Um, Lee, what I like to do on this podcast is to have guests introduce themselves. Now, I've teased your bona fides here a little bit, um, but if you don't mind, would you introduce yourself to tell people uh, why why you're on this? Uh, a prestigious podcast. Yes, <laughs> I'd be happy to. Um, Thank you. I worked for pg e for about 15 years. I uh, did a lot of uh, grid engineering, um, uh, you know, distribution engineering, that kind of stuff. Uh, I uh, left pg e in the early 90s and have since been an energy consultant, kind of an independent energy consultant, doing things like um, you know, developing new power plants, interconnecting renewables to the power grid. Um, so all of the kind of studies and engineering and contracts that uh, it has taken over the last 15 years in California to get to where they are now, which is at about 30% um, renewable power. And um, so I'm very familiar with the issues. I'm very familiar with how things work. Um, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good guy. If you're going to turn yourself loose in that 500,000 volt substation, I'm a good guy to bring along. <laughs> and you're an engineer by training, is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. And and you electrical engineering, or where did you tell me? Remind I, me. I know we've talked about this a long time ago. I've worked as an electrical engineer, and uh, for you know, are in the electric business for a long time. There are people that tell you that you're, if you're not trained in a, as an electrical engineer, you're not really one. Um, and there, you know, there's some truth to that, but I think I've gotten along over the years, uh, you know, with the amount of electrical engineering that I've been able to pick up. Okay, got it. Good. Well, so let's let's push on and, and talk about uh, what's going on in, in, in California. So the obvious question I want to ask, and there's been a lot of reporting on this, but why are these blackouts happening? <laughs> well, um, this, uh, they're happening because the sun goes down. I mean, that's about as simple as it gets. But uh, since the sun has been busy, especially in California with their 100, 110 degree weather, the sun warms up the buildings. And so when the sun goes down, people don't switch their air conditioning off. As a matter of fact, the peak load occurs uh, probably at about 7 o'clock at night long after the um, solar panels have stopped making electricity. The California ISO calls this the duck curve. And if you look at the curve of the load in California, it's something like resembles a duck because right as the sun goes down, a huge peak starts to build up and it sort of looks like the back of a duck and then the duck's head. The problem is when solar shuts off because California is now so reliant on solar, when solar shuts off, there's really nothing to replace it. And um, so they scramble, they buy from other states, they try to you know, get all the gas plants going, um, you know, they run the nuke as hard as it'll go, the one remaining California uh, nuclear plant, but it's not enough. I think uh, since there's a wide ranging heat wave over the West, uh, none of the other states have power to sell. They need all of theirs because their air conditioning load is high too. So, and, th and that's a key point as well, that California imports 25% of its electricity, roughly, right? Yes, but they, yes but they including have, a whole bunch of coal power. Yeah. Right, but they, but they haven't been able to import that because other states need all the electricity that they, that they have. Yes, yeah, absolutely right. So, but, so I've followed the situation in California. I've written a, a, about it a, a, a some. Um, why aren't they a, a using more wind energy? What's the issue in California? They built a lot of solar but uh, according to what I've seen on the California Energy Commission website, there's essentially no new wind capacity has been built in the state since 2013. Why? Um, wind is even less reliable than solar. Um, and it's hard to say, but I kind of think it's more expensive. It's really kind of easy 
to plunk down their solar field. I mean, you've got that huge Mojave desert area that just begging for solar power and there's a lot of it out there. So it's cheap and easy to plunk down solar in the hot parts of California. Wind is much more difficult to develop. You have to find a place where the wind blows all the time. And, and you know, and then when you get to selling wind, I mean, wind tends to be 25 to 30% there. You know, it, capacity factor of wind is, is lousy. And the capacity factor of solar, maybe not great, but you can count on it. You can pretty much count on the sun coming up every day. You can't, um, you know, depend on the wind blowing in the same direction at the same speed every day. It doesn't happen. So we're always balancing the grid against the wind. So I think people have just decided solar is a better deal. Well, it's interesting because I would have assumed you were going to say, um, and just in some of the reporting I've done, that the key problem with California is the issue of siding, that uh, Humboldt County just uh, uh, refused a new wind project in, I think, the end of last year. Uh, there was a project that was uh, aimed for an area near Lompoc that was also turned down that I, I thought you were going to say it was about siding of the wind projects. You're saying that uh, developers are just deciding it's not as valuable to them. Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, I, you know, the, my experience with the California ISO certainly suggests that they favor you know, solar development over wind as far as grid operations is concerned. I mean, they can't discriminate against you know, one thing or another, but um, they like solar because it's dependable. But I do take your comments about siting as, I mean, the neighbors hate that stuff. You know, they don't, they don't want to be around um, wind turbines and there's a lot of resistance there. So yeah, it's probably a combination of the two things. So, well, let's talk about siting as well in terms of transmission, because that's the other big land use challenge all across the country, but how important is the, is the lack of new transmission in California for some of these, these issues with relate, related to the blackouts? How, uh, what, what role is transmission playing here? Well, it, I mean, I, you know, as far as the blackouts go, I think transmission is secondary in terms of what's causing the current rolling blackouts. But in terms of California getting from 30% renewables to 50% or to 100% renewables, that's where they want to go, uh, it's absolutely critical and very, very expensive and time consuming. And so if you were a solar developer and you wanted to put a 300 megawatt uh, plant in California today, there's so much to be done to the grid and so little resource kind of available to do it that it will um, that the lead times are ridiculous and the expense of that is ridiculous which also plays into i know we're going to talk a little bit more about the rate situation in california and this need to reinforce and enlarge the power grid um, it plays into why rates are so high and why they're going to get higher as well the infrastructure wasn't built for this. And it basically has to be re-engineered and rebuilt in order to allow um, more renewables on. They're at the moment. So you're saying that for California then to achieve the, the renewable goals that it's set, and they're closing the Diablo, you mentioned the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant. So that's 2,400 megawatts, something like that of, of yes. capacity, baseload capacity, that's all gonna go away. No beginning, way. how soon is that plant closing Next down? Next year. Next year, I thought it was yeah. 2024, but they're gonna do, they're gonna do it sooner. Maybe it is, yeah. Um, yeah, that's right, I know they're, they're fa yeah, probably, that's right, that's right. I was thinking about the gas plants on the coast. So those are so scheduled to go in 2021, and Diablo Canyon is scheduled to come offline in 2024. That's right. Well, so I, I was looking at the CEC website. The, the state is, has already retired a lot of, of gas-fired capacity just in the last few years. So yeah. how important is that in terms of this uh, shortfall in power over the last uh, few days? How, how critical is that lack of, of gas-fired capacity? If, there hadn't, if they hadn't done that, if they hadn't taken all those gas plants out of service, there wouldn't have been an emergency. The gas plants would have carried it. Um, so <laughs> it, not only is it kind of, I mean, some of those were taken off through the actions of the California government, uh, including the ISO, but a lot of them were abandoned because 
the operators couldn't make any money. They were never called on to operate. You know, most days you don't need them. But when you do need them, they're absolutely critical. It's either keep them around and pay them not to operate, you know, most of the days, or live through these rotating blackouts, which will become worse in, in the future because of what you just said, the, you know, removing Diablo Canyon from the grid, removing the uh, you know, coastal gas plants. Uh, not only do that, does that cause a shortage of power, but since the renewable power is far away, out in the middle of the desert and the mountains, there's also a transmission issue of how do you get that power over the mountains into the LA basin or into San Francisco when there really isn't transmission capacity to do it. So they're jumping the gun here. <laughs> they really ought to keep those gas plants around and pay them whatever they need to stay in business until the transmission infrastructure is there, until the batteries are there, until there's enough solar and wind to carry the entire state and enough transmission to get it into the load centers. It, you know, you've really got the cart before the horse here. They're <laughs> really 10 years ahead of where, of where they think they are. So this is just all a result of bad policy. Oh yeah, it's, it's you know, politicians love utilities and uh, social agendas without raising taxes. You can just raise utility rates, you know, make them do it. So this goes back to kind of the earliest, you know, 1970s energy conservation programs, which the rate payers paid for whether they wanted to or not. You know, and then you can follow that train along into renewable energy. You can follow it in, along into fire policy where they made, you know, the utilities liable for, you know, for the damage from fires to the, you know, experiment that they did with deregulating the power business, which resulted in PG&E going bankrupt the first time. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it's just been a cascading uh, series of bad policy decisions that have gotten us to where we are, which is, you know, uh, California pays three times as much as many other states for electricity, and oh, when you need it, they'll turn it on. Uh, I just can't imagine a worse scenario, basically. So uh, something that just pops in my head, and maybe I will, I'll just put it out there. So my first book was on Enron now that 20 years ago, almost 20 yeah. years ago. And the, you know, the always the question was, well, why did bankrupt, why did Enron go bankrupt? Well, they run out of money. Why are the blackouts happening in California? Because they don't have enough power. Yeah. And, but that lack of sufficient electricity is a result of years of miscalculation, misreading the market. I mean, who's to blame here, I guess, is the, the other question I'm just, I, I really want to hear your, your answer to. The short answer, uh, Robert, is that the California legislature, um, they basically took over and, you know, started issuing mandates to the regulatory agencies, the Public Utilities Commission and the California Energy Commission and the California ISO, mostly to do with, number one, uh, experimenting with the deregulated market, and number two, more recently, demanding that uh, renewable power take priority above all else. That, uh, you know, they, I, th I think the regulators themselves, if left to their own devices, do a pretty good job. You know, they, they get a couple of things wrong, but by and large, you know, they do compromises and they keep the thing going. When the legislature got into it, did things like, um, you know, at the expense of grid reliability, they started building massive infrastructure process or forcing the utilities to do that, building huge infrastructure projects to- So, uh, so if I could interrupt, so you said the legislature is to blame and uh, it ultimately, and, but then, so the utilities and the regulators are just trying to accommodate what the legislators said, is that fair? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the, legisla the legislators hand out mandates, you know, in terms of California law that says we will have 30% renewables. So the um, regulators take that and run with it. And whatever else has to be cut, whether it's grid reliability or you know, financial decisions, they go with the legislature. They don't try to be reasonable. So that has resulted, I think, uh, in PG&E and Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric to some extent 
not spending enough money on maintenance, spending the money instead on building new infrastructure to pick up and deliver renewable power. And uh, I think if you look at the real reason for the, uh, the failure uh, of the PG&E equipment that caused the California fires and got PG&E in so much financial trouble, it was mandates from the regulators based on mandates from the legislature that caused them to make bad decisions with regard to grid reliability and deferred maintenance. So that climate change became a priority over reliability. Is that fair? Is that a fair? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great way to say it. Yeah. And it's still there. I mean, if you read the news um, clippings on what the experts in the state government are saying, they want to double down. They, you know, they're not seeing this rotating blackout thing as a problem. They're seeing it as a call to action to build more batteries and more solar and get rid of more gas plants because uh, that's the way you fix the climate. So it's not going to change. <laughs> they're doing the same thing. So you're, <laughs> so you think the problem only gets worse from here? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it does. I, I think that when Which you, is fine for you because you left California and live in Oregon. I left California. Yes, this is one of the reasons. Um, the, uh, I think if you, if you look at the, not only the political situation, but also um, the situation with regard to, you know, losing more gas and nuclear generation, you know, grid reliability is going to be the casualty in all those decisions that you won't have the ability to keep the grid up and functioning on most days. If they get rid of all that, you know, conventional generation, you'll have a, a reliability uh, situation, much like Haiti or the Republic of the Congo or someplace like that, where the power is on, you know, sporadically. I, I can actually see that happen in California if they stay on this path. You think it could, well, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's grim. I mean, that's a really grim outlook, but that's what you're, that reliability has just been pushed aside in favor of climate policy. Yes, and they're not getting the point from these current, from the current situation. So you mentioned rates before. So uh, the, uh, uh, if memory serves since 2013 or so, California's electric rates have gone up at a rate six times that of in residential, uh, well, I guess overall rates, six times that of the rest of the United States. The yes. Latest numbers show that those rates are going even higher Will the rate, will California electric rates continue upward? And if so, why? Um, yes, and, and upward at a greater rate than what you've seen in the past. Um, really? Yeah. Substantial, uh, substantially faster. Yes. It, 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 I mean, again, my comments are predicated on, you know, on Californians continuing to vote people into office who are dedicated to renewable power, et cetera, et cetera. So if we stay on the same path, in California, and here's what I think is going to happen. Um, at 30% renewables, you didn't have to fool around with the grid too much to um, interconnect enough renewables to get to 30%. But now the grid is full. There's no more extra capacity. So you have to start building extra capacity into the grid, and that's not cheap. Um, I would imagine it will be hundreds of billions of dollars in grid upgrades by the time you get to, you know, 50, 75% renewables. This, the first step of this has been very easy. The next step is going to be tremendously expensive and tremendously time consuming. The other um, thing that I think will drive rates up is batteries that um, as, you know, as we've seen with the rotating blackouts, you need some other source of power when the sun goes down. And right now we're relying to some extent on gas and, uh, and nuclear, but when that's gone, uh, you'll need batteries. And I don't think anyone really has a sense of how many batteries you need. Not only do you need batteries, but you need extra solar and wind to charge those batteries at the same time that you're running the grid. So you basically need to double the amount of solar that is out there now and use that doubled amount to charge batteries while the sun is up so the batteries can be drained when the sun is down. And someday, sometimes you go, you know, a week without too much sun or too much wind, 
So you've got to have batteries that last a week. Now, I don't know if there's any such thing. I don't think there is. But supposing they can be built, they won't be cheap. Um, but you have to have that kind of capacity in batteries. So between- And, who's, the rate, and, who, pay, and who pays for that? Well, the ratepayers. I mean, you know, there's no big stack of money here. The ratepayers are going to pay for that, unless unless the three trillion dollar, um, you know, uh, basket from the Feds uh, comes through for the Green New Deal. Uh, I think it will take a trillion dollars to get California to 100 percent. And if that happens, one 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 trillion for California so. alone. Yes, I think so. And. Um, and, and you just, these are back of the envelope calculations you've done by on your own. Yes. I know how much a battery costs. Um, you know, I know how much grid upgrades cost. I mean, it's not a difficult calculation to make. I wouldn't give myself more than, you know, 60 to 70% accuracy, but even if I'm half wrong, it's still half trillion dollars. Um, I think if it does do that, you know, if you, if you just do the rate making calculation and try to figure out how much it costs per, per month, to have electricity in a one bedroom apartment that's 100% renewable and fairly reliable, it's about $2,500 a month for a one bedroom apartment. If you add on that, those costs that you just laid out. Yeah, yeah. Wow. If you say, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, the, the costs are pretty easy to come by. There's a great little YouTube video that we could link to from Real Engineering called you know, getting California to 100%. And they do uh, a very a much more detailed calculation than I do, but we come to the close. But it's similar, similar order of magnitude. Yes, they didn't do the rate making uh, calculation. I did that. I just took the number of kilowatt hours and the number of customers and, you know, pretty simple. If you can do division, you can come up with how much a month, you know, so. Well, I mean, this is a really, I mean, frankly, a very depressing kind of outlook. I mean, just the, the, that if if these blackouts are happening now, and um, in fact, there was just a, a report came out from a, a, a company or outfit I'd never heard of the uh, called Rewiring America that says electrify everything. And they're, they claimed, oh, we can do this all across the country in 15 years, World War II style mobilization, we can convert everything to renewables. There was no calculation on land use, not a single one, uh, right. which right. Stuck, in, stuck in my craw. But nevertheless, the whole thing was based on, oh, well, we can do this and it's not going to be that hard. You're, what do you, what's your reply to that? Well, um, you know, I guess you can pretty much do anything for money. Uh, <laughs> if, you have a, if you have enough money, anything is possible. Yeah, it's possible. You know, I, yeah, okay. I, I, they didn't give you a price tag, I'm sure. You know, and I always question um, people who haven't been in the power business for a while when they start making assumptions. You know, they, the, the assumptions never really include the true cost of storage. I mean, that's just, that seems to be ignored. You know, the fact that in New York in the winter, you're going to have to store solar power from last summer and be using it in March. You know, I mean, how do you do that? Uh, so, I, yeah, I think that the costs of this thing are, you know, grossly underestimated. I don't think the Green New Deal's $3 trillion will get the whole country to 20%. It's sobering. I mean, it's really sobering. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and I, I, what I'm hearing you say without saying it is that you're glad you moved out of California and moved to Oregon. It, it, Oregon's a little more sane. You know, we, we get 2% of our power from renewables and a whole a bunch from coal and a whole bunch from hydro. So, yeah, we've got a long ways to go before we get that crazy. But, yes, I, I, you know, and the prices reflect it. Power here is cheap. <laughs> So what's next then? I mean, do you, do, I mean, how hopeful are you that, that California policymakers are going to understand or see this, these blackouts as a, as a time where oh, we need to really reconsider here? What, what, what do you think? When well, some of them start losing elections, I don't think it'll, I don't think it'll change till then. I mean, they're, you know, I mean, if you, if you, if you take a look at the history of 
developing renewable energy. There's been you know, hand wringing and pearl clutching going on now for 30 years. And what have we accomplished? You know, about three or 4% of the power that we, or the power and fossil fuel that we use in the United States now comes from renewable energy. So 30 years, very concerned about this. What have we accomplished? 3%. So is renewable energy important? For getting Democrats elected, it most certainly is. But if you look at what we've accomplished in terms of installing and utilizing renewable energy, you have to question that. You know, do people really, do we really think it's important or are we just having fun with it? So, oh, I mean, that's a really- uh... Plain old engineer who's connecting power every day. It's very clear that the scale of this thing is gonna be extremely difficult to manage. Well, you made a very political statement there, though, about that is renewable energy important. You said for electing Democrats, it is. It's vital. Like that it's yeah. vital, for, vital for Democrats. For Democrats. But if you actually look at the accomplishment, you know, the fact that we've been at this for 30 years and we just haven't done much, you know, what's all the hand-wringing about? Are we serious? We're not serious. Simple question, Lee. What, what will it take to, to solve this? What... What needs to happen in California now for the state to have, to get back to reliable electricity now after 20 years, after Enron, after now this, these series of blackouts, what needs to happen? Um, well, I think they have to change course. Basically they have to, you know, um, leave Diablo Canyon operating. They have to come up with some sort of way to keep the gas plants online and profitable so that people don't just walk away from them. And probably they need to add more gas peaking plants and more gas resources in order to cover situations like this. And I'm not saying that you can never get to 50% renewables, but I do think you have to rearrange the priorities to say, let's get to 50% renewables and then shut down the gas plants. You know, you can't, you can't just hook up all of this renewable power, and get rid of the conventional generation and just cross your fingers that everything's gonna work. It's like some crazy science fair experiment where you just say, all right, you know, this should work. And when it doesn't, um, then you have people out of power, you have people, uh, you know, on life support systems that, you know, can't get by and, you know, what are they supposed to do? You know, buy a generator? They're supposed to run down to Home Depot and get a generator and plug that, you know, breathing machine into that. It's it's really high stakes gamble um, to do what they're doing and just assume that renewable power on its own is going to be sufficient to carry the grid in a reliable manner. It's just not going to work. So are are the uh, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase what you just said and feed it back to you, but so. California politicians, and you've talked about the legislature, so the legislature is just effectively gambling with the future economy of the state by gambling on renewables? Is that, is that what I've heard you say? Well, they think they're saving us from global warming. But yes, I'd say that statement was correct. They are willing to gamble grid reliability for, you know, the benefits of being um, more in line with uh, climate action. Yeah, that's fair. So you sound like a, I mean, I, I'm going to just say it out loud. You, you sound like a partisan. You said renewables are, are, is renewable energy important? You said for, for electing Democrats, it is. Are you a Republican? I mean, what, what, how do your politics line out here? Uh, well, um, I, I live in Oregon, so I can't really say I am a Republican, but I do think that in terms of energy policy, things really started to go south when the Democrats got a super majority in, uh, in, in both houses of the legislature and the governor's office in California. Now there's nobody to say no. And I would, if the Republicans had a super majority and the governorship, I'd be worried about that too. You know, I think that somehow or other you have to achieve a balance or things run off the rails. And California hasn't had a balance for 15 years and things are pretty much running off the rails. 
So are you hopeful at all that this can correct in the next few years, or do you think it's just going to have to get a lot worse? I think, I think it's going to have to get a lot worse. But I do think that at some point, the voters are going to jump into this and say, wait a minute, we're going to unelect you if you, if you don't take care of this problem. You know, when you have bankrupt utilities, you have people out of service for days in the hottest part of the summer when the wind's blowing because of the fire might start. You have rolling blackouts. I don't know what else it takes, you know. What, what else are the good citizens in California going to be willing to endure before they either, you know, sort of change their political view or, um, or leave? And believe me, a lot of them are leaving. So, you know, it's, it's actually funny, trying to rent a U-Haul trailer in California is almost impossible. But if you want to rent a U-Haul trailer here in Oregon and take it to California, they'll practically give it to you for free. <laughs> So, I mean, it's a little depressing. It's a little depressing to hear you, your your view on this. But that that but you're as a, saying this as someone who's seen this now for four decades. You left the state in part because of what you saw. Yes. So it, it, um, it, let me let me ask you one last thing. So if if they really wanted to reduce CO two emissions, would the state be adding nuclear? Or what would be the the best way for the state of California to pursue given the constraints we've talked about on transmission, the constraints on wind, if the state wanted to pursue a lower carbon future, should nuclear be a bigger, bigger part of that? Nuclear should be a bigger part of it. Um, it strikes me that there are two ways to go to a, you know, a less carbon intensive future. And one way is nuclear power in conjunction with however much wind and solar they want, you know, okay, as long as you can keep the lights on and nuclear power would be a big part of that. Or to get sort of draconian about rationing. I mean, if you kind of look at the gasoline situation and the public and the, uh, you know, grid power situation in California, there's clearly an agenda there to make both of those commodities um, as expensive as possible. And, uh, and, and it's working, it, it's, it's getting, you know, really expensive to buy gas and buy uh, power in California. And so, and I think that's to kind of drive conservation to some extent that there's a real agenda there that says, gee, if we make it really expensive, maybe people won't use so much of it. Um, but why not take that a step further? Why don't we ration that? Why don't we limit the amount of you know, jet travel. Why don't we uh, ration gasoline? Why don't we ration electricity? Why don't we just, you know, push? It seems to me that it seems to me that that that's a winning strategy for losing if you're a politician. Absolutely. Right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Inconvenience of voters, right? That'll get you reelected. Yeah. Well, so but what about the regressive part of that? Because and, and I'll, we can maybe end with this, but. I've written about this. It deeply concerns me because of just the the social equity issue here. Yeah. But what? But how? Wh let me ask the question: How does social justice then? And we hear about environmental justice, social injustice, inequality. How is that playing out in energy politics in California, in your view? Well, I think if you make gasoline and power more expensive, then the people who earn less money are the ones that are going to be hurt by it, right? I mean, when gas got to be, when oil got to be $150 a barrel, uh, you could see the change in traffic patterns on the LA freeways. You know, it knocked the bottom 10% right off of, uh, right out of the traffic pattern. I mean, people couldn't afford to drive. So who was it that couldn't afford to drive? Well, you know, minimum wage folks that had to get to work somehow. I, you know what I mean? It's sort of, those are the victims of expensive energy. That's, um, you know, the, the, those of us who are a little more fortunate and maybe have a few more bucks in the checking account, it doesn't bother us so much to pay five, six, seven dollars a gallon for gasoline. But if you're making 15 bucks an hour, it gets your attention. You know, you just can't do what you want to do. You can't get to work. So, you know, social justice doesn't seem to be served by, by making things more expensive. But it could, as you said, in a somewhat, well, I won't say cynical, but 
realistic way, if you really want to cut CO2 emissions, you limit the amount of energy people can use. That's the other way to get it done, right? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, if you ration, then everybody gets the same share, don't they? At whatever the price the government sets. Well, why don't we end it there, Lee? You've been very kind with your time. Uh, this has been very uh, um, educational about what's going on in, in California and why these blackouts are happening. Um, so let me let me end it with uh, with with that one. Um, so thank you all for listening to this is a special uh, recording of the Power Hungry podcast. My guest is my guest has been Lee Cordner, former PG and E employee and longtime uh, energy consultant in the state of California. Lee, thank you for your time today. Um, I may check on you again to when if right. we have more more blackouts. We'll uh, check <laughs> in again. So. Uh, thanks to all of you again for listening to the Power Hungry Podcast. Tune in, subscribe, uh, rate us on ratethispodcast.com uh, and uh, tune, in, tune in to the next episode. Thanks again. Bye.